Alan and Sharon, thank you for the opportunity to talk in your session. And uh, to the audience, thanks for sticking around for the last session. Uh, the topic is tips for safe excision of inguinal mesh. And I will try to get through everything in 10 minutes. These are my disclosures. And I wanted to start off with the fact that while as surgeons we are out there doing hernias and patients are going online and figuring out which hernia surgeon they want to go to, what we don't do well and what we're not taught well is that when a patient complains of post-operative pain that there may be something wrong that happened after you finished your operation. And those events can be divided in things that happen right when they're waking up and events that happen over the first 7 to 14 days. But if they continue to complain about pain for more than three months, there could be an issue and you shouldn't ignore it. Uh, this is just showing that uh, did scar tissue cause pain? And this was a 30-year-old man who had a recurrent inguinal hernia repaired with open mesh placement. And then he had persistent post-op pain. Uh, he was sent to pain management clinics. Uh, he eventually went to see another surgeon because the first surgeon said, listen, I don't know what else to do for you. Uh, the second surgeon took them back to the OR, found scar tissue, removed the mesh and the nerves. Uh, they were sued. The plaintiff claimed that the surgeon injured both uh, ilioinguinal and genital branches. And the doctor's defense, of course, was that there was no nerve injury and everything was done as it should be, and this is a known complication. And what do you think the result was? an $8.2 million verdict to the patient. Okay, so that's an expensive hernia repair, and that's what the title of this, and it says that it's an extreme verdict, but none of these patients would say that this was a routine operation, and I think it's very, very important for surgeons, and my message to, to surgeons that I teach is that if the chief complaint is pain, and they're there to see a hernia, do not automatically assume that you've got a hernia on your hands, and don't just fix it. It's really, really important. So if the chief complaint is pain, focus on the pain. And really the first thing you need to say is, okay, when did the pain start and what were you doing? And then you're gonna get the rest of your history out there. Um, the pain exam is different than the hernia exam. The pain exam has to start with the patient's back, hip, groin, leg, pubis, and then you're gonna do something called pain mapping, and pain mapping is something that Regal Alvarez has been promoting. Finally, just published in our, in our Sages manual on hernia repair, but it's, it's a system of using pluses, minuses, and zeros, and taking the patient's pain complaint and turning that into a visual image uh, that you can take a photograph of and actually put that into your EMR, into your paper chart. And I use these all the time, and I actually have taken a, this another level, which I'll show you, and we've gone to doing video uh, pain exams so that we get it, it documented exactly how the patient is, exp is experiencing it. You then want to go out and get old operative reports. You want to read them. You want to look at the technique and the implants that were placed and where they were placed. And you want to review the CAT scans and the MRIs of the pain. So for instance, this is a CAT scan. And what you see here, and the, and the arrow is going to show you the things to focus on, those little white uh, marks are clips. And those clips generally shouldn't be into the muscular layer. And they certainly shouldn't be lateral to the inferior epigastrix. Uh, you, it is normal to see clips down near Cooper's, and those usually don't cause any pain and are totally accepted. But when you take that CAT scan and you see a patient who's complaining of specific focal pain in two specific spots, and you can draw it out, and this is, this is the ACES here on the left, uh, you can focus your surgery in removing just the tacks. But I think drawing on your patients preoperatively is really the first tip that I want to recommend to you, which is sit down right before the operation, even though you've already done it in the exam, a week or two weeks or a month beforehand, and hash out exactly on their abdomen what they want you to look at when you're inside. Openly discuss your operative plan, and then draw some more. Can we have the volume up? The hernia surgery? Yeah. And is this also the pain that you had before the hernia surgery? Yes. Yeah. Okay, let's just point to your hip bone for a second. Okay, and we're just going to point to the pubic bone, which is the, the bone. Okay, that's down here. And the tubercle is over here. Okay? Here. And I have my patients, and I video them, so that we document exactly where their pain is, because if you know as well as I do, their stories change the next time they come back. And so having videos documented is extremely important with these cases. Informed consent is really important, and, and we make no mistake about going through each of these things and making sure they put their initials next to each one. But some of the important ones to highlight are ongoing groin pain, 
ongoing systemic symptoms. Some people do have um, foreign body reactions and they can get sweats, they can get weight loss, they can get pain in other parts of their body and, and really be confused as to what's causing it. Bleeding and infection, numbness, testicular pain or chitis or ischemia, visceral or vascular injury, recurrent or new hernia formation, and small or large bowel obstruction from adhesions that will form afterward. And I think it's important to drive all that home before you take on these cases. So that's tip number two. Informed consent should be specific for that operation. And write those things out. Uh, removal of mesh that was placed through a minimally invasive surgical technique. So this is mesh that was placed robotically or laparoscopically. Uh, you're going to set this up like a transabdominal preperitoneal repair. Uh, you can do these lap or robotically. You're going to start lateral and superior. You're going to stay on the mesh. You're going to avoid harm to uh, organs like the bladder, the epigastric vessels, the iliac vein, the vas deferens, and the retroperitoneal nerves. Uh, I borrowed this video from uh, Igor Beliansky. And what you see here again is his version of pain mapping right before he went in. Uh, he's got two spots of severe pain. He drew out here uh, the ilio inguinal ligament. And what you'll see demonstrated in this short clip is what I just showed you before, which is you start at the superior edge of your mesh, and eventually you'll get into a plane uh, between the mesh and the abdominal wall. And before you dive in there, you're going to come out lateral, where there's going to be some virginal tissue and some areolar tissue that you can dissect through. And basically, it's almost analogous to uh, dissecting out a vessel, but you're going to get control laterally and superiorly. Uh, and believe it or not, immediately near the bladder will come out well as well. Uh, so here, uh, we're pulling on the mesh and we're using uh, electrocautery on the end of an endoshear to do most of the dissection. The instruments that you'll use in your right hand will typically be a scissor with monopolar cautery, a Maryland with monopolar cautery, uh, or some suction to do most of this dissection. You can also use a hook in certain spots. Uh, but again, as we said before, you want to look for the epigastrics, the gonadal vessels, the vas deferens. The, in this case, it's the right side, the right iliac vein, and then the bladder. And what the purpose of this dissection, and what I'm showing in this video clip of Igor's, uh, is how to find that vas deferens. And so you see we're peeling off uh, the gonadal vessels as, as to the right of the Maryland right there. And coming into view uh, shortly will be the, the vas deferens. And it's important really to identify that and peel that off without harming it if you can. Of course, you'll have consent to do the vasectomy if you need to during these operations. And here it comes right there. Uh, so you see there the vas deferens. And once you see that, you get a better sense of the anatomy where the cord's going to be. And you'll know from finding that very important landmark that your iliac vein is going to be next. The iliac. Uh, vein is going to have fat around it, and so there's usually going to be a plane between the vein and the mesh, but not always. And it's important that as you're dissecting, if you start to get into bleeding, it's probably a sign to stop and it's okay to leave a little bit of mesh on that vein instead of disrupting it. But of course, there are situations where you will make a hole in that vein and you need to have a plan uh, to sew that up, and I'll show one example of that at the end. Uh, as far as using articulating instruments, uh, such as robotic instruments or any other articulating instruments. Uh, there is some evidence that using articulation uh, will enhance the ability to do these operations. Uh, this is a poster by my friend and colleague, uh, Sharon Tofai, uh, where she compared laparoscopic versus robotic assisted mesh removal after inguinal hernia repair. And she uh, examined uh, 17 cases that she had done laparoscopically and compared it to nine cases she had done robotically. There's a learning curve going forward here, so some of the results may be uh, from getting better over time. But you can see that there is a dramatic difference between the uh, post-operative or intraoperative issues she ran into uh, in the lap group uh, were some vascular injuries, uh, needing to clip epigastric vessels, injury to the iliac vessel uh, compared to robotically. And then looking at nerve injuries, spermatic cord injuries, and length of hospital stay was the same. So again, there may be a learning curve issue here, but she found and still believes that there is an advantage to using uh, robotic instruments to do this dissection. Uh, here's another tip that she shared, and I agree with, that if you are dealing with a patient who has a pulling sensation uh, on their scrotum or on their testicle, by actually pulling on that cord during your dissection can sometimes show you where to dissect 
and free that mesh up from the cord. And sometimes the mesh has gone into the cord and into the vase so much, you can't separate the two, and that's when you just wanted to separate it from the vase. There's nerves that run around the vas deferens that can send that signal uh, down to the testicle. Here's another example that she shared of spermatic cord lysis. Uh, this is the vas deferens right here, and the mesh is in, was entrapping the top part of the uh, vas deferens, and so by using robotic instruments or, or lap instruments, you can lyse this material right here and free up the vas deferens uh, from harm in moving with the mesh. Uh, situation I see a lot is, is, is recurrence after mesh plug. Uh, that was done, this plug was placed through the indirect space. You can see it's nowhere near it anymore. It's, it's migrated immediately. Uh, this was not for chronic pain, but you can take a mesh plug out very easily. This is being done during a TEP approach. And because this is not a pain case, I've chosen not to risk vascular injury. There's a piece of mesh that was stuck to the junction between the epigastric and the external iliac, and so we're gonna leave a cuff of mesh on that part right there and take it out completely. Uh, you wanna use scissors to cut through that mesh, and as you can see, polypropylene mesh does divide easily with the use of scissor with cautery. And then we're using Maryland here to take some of the soft tissue at the end. But there's that cuff of mesh sitting on the inferior epigastrics in the right groin. This is uh, a video that Eugene Dickens has shared. I just wanted to show very quickly what, uh, an iliac vein injury look like. Uh, this is not during a mesh removal, but it can happen. And you see if you're dissecting with cautery and you get into the wrong spot, you can actually make an accidental hole in the iliac vein. And so you're gonna need to have a plan to fix that. Uh, taking out mesh that was placed by an open technique, obviously these are gonna be approached open. Uh, and since I'm out of time, I'll just tell you very quickly, you're gonna dissect to the external oblique, you're gonna define your anatomy, you're gonna open the external oblique, I usually like to do it from the external ring toward the asis. You're gonna define the cord, you're gonna remove the mesh, and then you're gonna try to close healthy tissue to healthy tissue as best you can. These are the situations where I tell patients it's better off that you get a hernia than more pain, and I, I let them heal. So in conclusion, history and exam are vital. You have to confirm the exam and plan immediately before the OR, that drawing on the belly is really important. Define the anatomy before the dissection and avoid injury to vital structures and have a plan B in case you do injure something. Thank you very much for the opportunity to present.